Hello, I'm Dr. Tony Romans, Pastor of Faith Fellowship Church. Welcome to the worship service here in Athens, Texas. We're glad you've joined in today. The book of James is about maturity. It's about growing up in the Lord and understanding what it means to live your faith practically. We've started this series a couple Sundays ago, and today we're going to be looking at the first place faith is impacted when we begin to uh, doubt, and that's in our prayer life. I want to invite you to take the Word of God and open it with us to the book of James, the first chapter today as we look at it, the passage and we preach a message entitled, The Death of Doubt. So today I pray that God will speak to your heart, you'll be blessed, and your faith will be built up and strengthened, that your prayer life will be strengthened and helped as we go to God's Word together. Again, thanks for tuning in. We'd love to invite you to come, be with us in person if you can, if you're in the Athens area. Our service begins at 10 o'clock. You'd be our welcome and morning guest. Lord bless. Have a great day. the cross for us no matter what the need or the burden or the need. but today take your Bible and open it with me again in the book of James we just started last week uh, a series of sermons through that uh, book of the word of God this fall mm -hmm. end of summer and fall as we uh, are looking at it under the title of practical Christianity uh, I'm going to repeat it a lot because by the time we're through I hope every one of you uh, have it maybe by now you already do nine years later you should have to say, if somebody stops you on the street and says, hey, I heard you go to that Faith Fellowship Church out on 175 East. <laughs> East. Yes, we do. Tell me about it. What kind of church are y'all? Tell me what we are. We're a group of Christian people that have gathered together under the blood of Jesus to be biblical, spiritual, and practical. Biblical, if the Word of God says it, we're not looking for a plan B. Spiritual, not some cold dead religion, but a living, intimate relationship with God through His Son Jesus. And Practical. That our faith impacts our daily life. If my faith doesn't change how I treat my wife, it's not good for anything. James, one of the most practical books of the New Testament, some to refer to it as the New Testament book of Proverbs. If you've, we've been studying Proverbs in life groups on Sunday morning, and so you understand how chock full of practical wisdom that book is. And we come to James, and it's the same way. We begin the series last week saying, here's a guy who just got saved, and he comes to James and says, James, I just gave my heart to Christ. I want you to disciple me. Help me get ready for this walk. I want to do well. What, what do I need to do? James, well, let's start right here. First of all, you've got to know how to deal with trials and trouble. You got to, they're coming. If Satan can lick the red off your candy, if he can sideline you, if he can get you to quit through trials and troubles, you're not going to be very practical in your walk with God. You're going to be sidelined. You're not going to be great glory to God. You're not going to walk in victory. The war, the, the, the war is yours. It's won. But you're not going to walk in the victory Christ provided for us. And we talked about those four things, about count, know, let, and ask. All in the imperative command. But we're going to see today where that first place, he says, your faith is going to be attacked. Your faith is going to be attacked. But where is the first place that that faith is going to be adversely impacted? Stand with me as we begin reading in uh, verse 6 and read down through verse 8 together. Get out. Well, we're going to start with verse 6 on the board. Read it out loud together. Then I'm going to read verse 7 and 8. Read verse 6 with me, would you? But let him ask in faith with no doubt. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. Now look at verse 7. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Let's pray. Father, we stand under the authority of your word. Today, God, we need you. We need the wisdom that your word provides. We need, Father, your Holy Spirit to be our teacher, to help us understand it. And then, God, by your Spirit's power and enabling in our life to live it out to the full. So, Father, today, we thank you in advance, believing in faith that you want to speak to us. Believing in faith, the, the truth of your word, that your word, when it goes forth, accomplishes everything that you send it forth to do. So, Father, today, as you send it forth into our hearts and lives, may it accomplish everything that needs to accomplish in me and in each of us here. To your glory, to your honor, we ask you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Be seated. <clears throat> well, as we said, in the midst of trials and troubles and tribulation, a man needs wisdom to know how to handle it. So James has made no problem. Look, there's a God who gives all men liberally and abraded not. God doesn't hold back. God doesn't shame you for coming in lacking wisdom. He said, you go to God and you ask God for the wisdom you need 
to walk in faith in these trial times. So, well, by the way, when Satan brings his first tool against you like he did Eve, you don't realize the first tool Satan used in the Garden of Eden was doubt, right? Eve rehearsed what Adam had told her God had said. And what did Satan say? Has God really said? Can I get you to doubt that? Can I get you to doubt for a moment that the truth of God to you, the promise of God to you, is really applicable and really true and that God is going to do for you what He said He'll do? So he says, listen, I, I want you to understand that uh, when you begin to pray, the first place that faith is, is absolutely essential is in our prayer life. Think about it for a moment. What could be more hypocritical? What could be more ridiculous than talking to God when you don't believe in Him? But because it's a religious habit, because it's a thing I know I'm supposed to, I'm going to do it, but do the right thing, but the wrong way. James says, listen, there's a God in heaven and He loves you and He's brought Christ that you might through faith and repentance in Him be born again into His family. He loves you. He wants to be a father to you and He wants you. Listen, our faith in Him, our trust in Him, our conviction in Him is not negotiable. Amen. You can't be saved without faith. We're not sanctified without faith as far as walking in day by day. And when it comes to our prayer life, one of the most essential things of a Christian's life to maintain our walk with God so that maturity and victory can come over time is our prayer life. And Satan says, uh, James says, Satan's going to test your faith. And by the way, when you ask, let him ask in faith. Let's talk about it for a moment. I want you to see, first of all, let's look at the contrast. The first part of verse 6 gives a contrast between two words. The first word is the word faith. It's the word faith. Now, now when it comes to prayer, there, there's two struggles we have. And the one is that I fear, and you're not to answer this for your life, but I fear as pastor and relating with uh, Christians uh, on a larger scale, I fear that far, far, far too many Christians accept doubt as a way of life. You know, my personality, I just, I, I, it's just hard for me to trust. Well, I can understand it if you're talking about men or women. The other thing that gives itself some difficulty when sometimes when it comes to, to believing God is that we have never, ever, ever known anybody that's a giver like Him. I've never known anybody like that. Now, I promise you the most generous and gracious and benevolent person you've ever known can't touch the hem of his garment when it comes to the giver that God is and the provider that God is for all of his children. The first word I want us to look at is that word faith because it is a fundamental attitude of the people of God. It, it brings us to, to salvation, for by grace are we saved through faith. It's the gift of God, not of works, as any man should boast. We have to come to Christ believing that we're sinners and separated from a holy God. We believe that. We don't just think it. It comes to a conviction. I believe that. I, I accept that as true. That Jesus Christ, God's Son, came and he lived a sinless life and he died on Calvary to be my substitute that God sent him to accomplish in me what I could not accomplish by myself. That God, that Christ came and died, that He might be the, my acceptable gift for my sin before a holy God. That He might sanctify me, justify me before a holy God. I believe that. It's a conviction in my faith. I repent of my sin and I pray. And through the, the, the hands of, of prayer, I reach out in faith and receive Him as Savior and Lord of my life. And I believe that. And Christ comes in and He saves me. And I experience the redemption the newness on the inside where God saves me and brings me from spiritual life, spiritual death to spiritual life. All of that is by faith. We're saved by faith. But listen, faith that the saving is only the beginning. It doesn't stop there. It's every day of our life. I continue to walk in faith day by day. I continue to hope in faith. I continue to serve in faith. I continue to worship in faith. And God, I grow and I mature in Him only by, with, and in, and through faith. Amen. Not a hope, not a, I suppose but a heartfelt conviction. A conviction that brings expectation and anticipation. 
that I expect God because if I believe, I, I trust and I expect and I anticipate all of those things are built up in faith. When he said it's the substance of things I hope for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith is not by any means. Listen, don't ever believe a lie that faith is a leap in the dark. That is the greatest lie I've ever heard. Faith is God revealing Himself, turning the light on to who you are and to who He is. God, God with a great spotlight says, here I am. Here's how much I love you. Come jump into my arms. There ain't no darkness. There's no, there's no illusion. There's no confusion. I know in whom I believe and am persuaded. I know God, how do I know Him? God revealed Himself. If God not revealed Himself, we'd never know Him. His greatest revelation of Himself is in Jesus who said, if you see me, you see the Father. Faith is not some mystical hope so, think so, maybe so. It's looking at God, knowing who God is, and knowing that God has said so, I know it's so. And so when I go to God in prayer and I ask, now some would say that this uh, discussion about faith is about the asking for wisdom. Certainly it is, but I'm going to see in a minute though, it's not just that. Sure, why would I go ask God for somebody who really think He'd give it to me? God, I'm in trials and troubles. God, I... You know, every morning the sun comes up, there's, there's some truths I face every morning. God, I don't have the wisdom to live this day. I don't have it in myself. Now, I'm educated. I've got, I've got a doctorate. I'm, I'm educated. God, I don't have the wisdom to live this day. God, I don't have the strength, spiritual strength, or physical of myself, to live this day by myself. God, I'm a man of neediness. And you're a God of sufficiency. So God, today, in my need, I come to you believing and knowing that you are and that you are glad to give to your child. Not because of me, but because of his character, because of his nature. God, on, in accord to your mercies, in accord to your character, in accord to your great benevolence, I come believing. It's the fundamental attitude we saw a while ago. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and there's a reward of those who are diligently seeking. You might remember that verse when every once in a while we look at the message about uh, God being a rewarder. I, I preach a message called Payday Sunday. I stole the title from R.G. Lee. It's not his sermon, but it's his, his sermon title. Because God is a rewarder. We look at those two kinds of reward. One is what's called payday rewards. You've earned, you've served, you've worked. Now you, your salary. The other is, uh, is the payback. It's the uh, re being reimbursed out of company funds for company expense. Those two words are used in the New Testament. Here in this verse, only in the Word of God, those two words are put together. Apostle Nehemiah. He's a rewarder. He pays his wages and he pays back. You don't do anything in the family business to pay that God doesn't reward. But listen, you must believe that he is. Amen. That he's a rewarder. See, so Satan wants you to believe that God's a taker. I hate that. We sing a song sometimes that he gives and takes away. And I cringe at that. It's, it's true. If you decide, if you look at what it is he takes away, he takes away my guilt, my shame. He takes away my sin. He takes away the distance between me and him through the blood of his son. See, Satan is a liar and he wants you to think that God is a taker. The truth is there's no greater giver you'll ever encounter than the God of heaven. And faith says that he's a rewarder of those who believes that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who gives and receive him. Jesus said to his disciples one day, Surely I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only say to this fig tree, but also you will say to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, and it will be done. Jesus talked about a mustard seed, mustard seed size of faith. Why? You see, it's not the size of my faith. It's the size of my God. Amen. A little bit of faith in the glorious God of heaven plenty. Jesus said faith, believing believing that you heard from God, that you know God, that you understood that you're walking in, that you're living in, that you're there. There's a statement about Abraham. Now remember the context, he was 100 years old, Sarah, he and her both were way past childbearing years and yet the angel comes and says in your old age you're going to have a son. In Romans chapter 4 spouting Abraham as a picture of faith. The Apostle Paul pulls him out of history 
and uses that illustration. Hear what, listen to what he says about Abraham. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. We need to give glory to God after the baby was born. Uh, before the baby ever got there. That's faith. Well, we're already praising God and giving God the glory. When he hadn't done it yet, but we know that this is true to his word. We know that God, is, his promise is sure. Now listen, if you're hearing me say some kind of name and claim, uh, you don't know me. And you need to listen to more of my messages to get them all clear. I'm not talking about giving you a want list and going out there and naming it and going to claim God's going to give me me, now God's going to give me this, God's going to give me. That's not the foolishness that I'm talking about. I'm talking about a life to live in God in victory over trials and troubles. Uh, the wisdom, the living, the living of these days in a way that brings honor and glory to God. The promises of God that He's made us in His Word. That you are my child, that you will be conformed to the image of my Son. That Satan himself, the world and the flesh can't keep that from happening. One day, you're going to be just like Him. And that in the living of these days, if I walk with Him in obedience and in faith, and I, I walk with God in, 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 in obedience to His will for my life. He's going to be transforming me more and more, even now. Even now, into that likeness. Well, the first word is faith. The second word is the opposite of faith. And maybe you're thinking doubt. And you're going to see where I'm coming from, I hope. But I want you to think of the word fear. Because fear is doubt in action. Fear is doubt in action. I say all the time, the opposite of faith is fear. Uh, today, we, we live in a time, I was talking to a preacher buddy the other day, and he said he, he had a couple of ladies got mad at him in his church on Sunday when he preached a message, and he talked about some of you living in fear, and even in these corona times, you know, and they got mad at him, thinking that somehow we're not supposed to be afraid. Well, listen, child of God, if, you're my, if your motivation for anything is fear, you've missed God, and I don't care what we're talking about. God does not operate in the realm of fear. He's not giving us a spirit of fear, but a power of love and a sound mind. Wait a minute, the the Word of God says, fear God and begin wisdom. But it's not talking about phobia. It's talking about reverence and all of who He is and His great glory. It's not talking about a, a debilitating fear or a phobia of God. He says, listen, He comes to God and He asks in faith with no doubting. Doubting. The Apostle Paul talking about following your conscience in chapter 14 of the book of Romans. Remember that, that, that illustration of eating meat sacrificed to idols versus not? And he's saying you know, different Christians have different convictions of conscience. There's things that the Word of God says there. It's no issue about if thou shalt or thou shalt not. It's the same for me as it is for you. But there are other things that are not covered, thou shalt or thou shalt not. And one of them in Paul's day was if uh, you eat meat to sacrifice to an idol, is that sin? Some say, hey, it's good stewardship. I can get it cheap. Good stewardship. Others said, no, 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 no. That was a part of a satanic ritual. Somehow the, the, the ritual is attached to that meat. You shouldn't eat it. That's a matter of conscience. I've had people ask me all kinds of stuff. Could, should you mow your grass on Sunday? Should you watch television? Should you ever play a game of cards? I'm talking about old maids and go fish. Should you do anything with deck of cards? All kinds of stuff. And there is a place in life for your convictions in mind that they make difference. But here's how Jay, here's how Paul sums up how do you know if it's right for you. Now listen to what he says, Romans 14, 23. But he who doubts is condemned if he eats because he does not eat from faith. For whatever is not from faith is sin. If you're dealing with matters of conscience and you're doubting if you should or not, let me tell you, if you doubt, don't do it. Why? Because you ought to have a clear, subtle faith that it's right. You do it before you do it. So he says, listen, when it comes to this this contrast there, we're going to live our life either by faith or we'll live our life in fear. Believing God or doubting God. Now, there, there, there's, there's wisdom. You know, uh, uh, I'm having to accept slowly the fact that there are some good snakes. <laughs> slowly, at 61, I'm, I'm about to get there. There are some good ones. Usually, the only, only good one is a dead one. But, uh, but, uh, just listen. You're going to live your life one of two ways. You're going to believe that God is and that God is who He says He is and God will do what He says He'll do. Every promise of God is for us as children. Every promise of God. Everything that Jesus said He was. Everything that Jesus said He'll do. Everything that Jesus said He would accomplish in us. Everything He promised when the Holy Spirit would come and save us and come into us. All that it would mean. You believe that. 
And fear is not the motivation for a child of God to ever walk in and live their life out of it. Ever. I don't care what we're talking about. Raising children. Man, we can be fearful. That's not what God's called us to do. God's called us to do that in faith. We, we can look at our current day viruses, or we can look at cancers, or we can look at health concerns, and we can live our life every day in some kind of debilitating fear about those things. Or he said, there's a sovereign God in heaven who's numbered my days. He has my name written in the palm of his hand. And he loves me. Listen, if you can see heaven and see his kitchen, my picture's on his refrigerator. He loves me. He loves me with a coward's love. And it's him and him whom I trust. I live and move and have my being. Now, I don't run out and play in the streets in front of cars. No, God's given us wisdom. God's given us a brain. But not to live in fear. Is living faith in him. The second part of that verse is a comparison. Notice what he says in verse 6. The second part he says, with no doubting, for your doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. Now, he, 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 he talks about the wave and he, he gets both directions of the wind, of the wave. He talks, first of all, as you get that picture of a wave, he's talking about the vertical, the ups and downs of life. A man who uh, has faith but also uh, has doubt and walks in fear. It's like a wave. It's up and down. It's sort of an inside job of the wave. It's the pressure coming in from inward. It's that wave when uh, Daddy run trot lines. We decide we're going to go. He'd get to the river and he'd start looking. We'd start straining to see. If we could see the white caps of the river, if we could see the white caps. We're not getting out of that little boat today trying to pull the trot lines. It's too, it's too bad. But that wave, that up and down, they're up and down, they're up and down. One day, man, they're on fire, going to take hell with a water pistol. Next day, you can't find them. Where they at? Where they, where they go? And, and, that, and we understand that that, that saves, that's warfare. Satan wants to get us up and down, up and down. And the only way we combat that is come to faith and say, on this rock I will build my life, I will not be moved. That when, fate, when, when doubt comes, I will recognize it for what it is. It is the fiery dart of the enemy. I will not allow it to make its way in and begin to impact my life and my thoughts about God. I have control over that. I have control over that. I don't have to, I don't have to let doubt and fear. So some people live their life in fear. And, and, and the great lie Satan has told you is that, well, Brother Tony, not to live in fear, but you, you, can't, you can't beat it. You can't get over it. He's a liar and the father of all lies. I ain't got one kind of Holy Spirit and you've got another. I don't have one dose of Holy Spirit and you have another dose. We've got the same redemption. We've got the same Savior. We've got the same Holy Spirit. We've got the same victory. We've got the same promise. The only question is we've got to make the same decision. In faith, believe God and walk with God. He says that vertical, that confidence Certain one day, down for the next, up and down, up and down. But then not only up and down, the vertical is the horizontal, over here and over there, over here and over there. The wind blows it from the east, that blows it to the west. The wind blows it, blows it to the east. Over here and over there, that horizontal movement, driven and tossed, directions not from God or from His Word. You understand if Satan can get you out of the direction of His Word, we're going to... James talks a lot about direction and the will of God in this very practical book. We're going to see it several times before we're done. But he talks about direction, the direction of your life. What is it that's going to determine the direction of your life? And I want to, I want to move in God's direction. I want to move in God's way. I want to move in spiritual progress, going forward with God. Well, hey, you can't let the wind toss you to and from, blow you off the course, blow you over here, blow you over there. We've got to have our life anchored in, with, and through the Word of God. And then by faith, we trust God and we believe that He is. And it's by faith. It's not an opinion. It's my conviction that God is not a God of lie. God's a God of truth. And I'm going to believe Him. Yeah, but there's times I believe God didn't come through. Yet. Either that or what you asked for was outside of the will of God. Did you, did you really ask God, God to do your best for me? Well, then let God decide what that is. We all, you know, one of the things I learned as a young Christian is I wanted to pray and then be God myself and tell God what to do. You know, sometimes uh, husbands and wives can do this little silly game. Children can do it. Say, if you love me, you'll do this. If you love me, you'll do that. If you love me. God looks at you, you've got to be kidding. If you love me. Did you gaze at the cross like that? Did you take your eyes off the cross? What happened? Where did that if come from? 
Can I say to you, not only when God placed you in your mother's womb nine months before your birthday, but 2,000 years ago, God settled with the most definitive answer the earth has ever known. How much does God, does He love us and how much does He love me? Just look at the cross and get the answer. That's how much God loves us. God doesn't have to dance to your tune to demonstrate His love to you. He's already demonstrated. Now, if you'll have the wisdom to let God, who loves you most, advance, choose for you, you'll always be thrilled with His answer. Even when it's no, because you'll know that's what it needed to be. That's what it needed to be. And in faith, I trust God with it. The Apostle Paul says similar to the church at Ephesus. He says that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. Listen, that wind is trying to blow you off course. That wind is trying to get you over here and over there. It's a demonic, it is a deceitful world, flesh, and devil breeze is blowing. It's not of God. It's not of God. Raise yourself in the Spirit of God and let the Spirit of God fill it. And don't ever doubt the course. Go with it. Go with it. Well, the comparison... Number three, the consequences, verse 7. He says, For let not that man, New King James says suppose, I believe King James says think. That's what the word means. Let not that man think that he will receive anything from the Lord. He's further let's talk about the man. Don't let that man think he will. You see, it's the idea. It's, play, it's, play, it's a play on words. You won't think in faith. So he said, if you won't think in faith, don't think you'll get anything. Uh, it's, it's kind of a play on, on, this, on the hypocrisy and the stu stupidity of patronizing God by praying, but not worshiping God or, or honoring God by praying in faith. Have you ever been patronized? Has that ever happened to you? Don't you just hate it? To be patronized, flattered. Many times our, our, our response to God is, is a little more than just patronizing God. So listen, he said, listen, if you're a man that won't think in faith, don't think. Out here is going to be what it ought to be when in here is not what it ought to be. In here ought to be faith, conviction, believing, trust, expectation. All of that should be in faith about what it is. He said, so first of all, don't let that man think he's going to get anything. But then notice, the man... That that man who thinks wrong is not going to get. But the message is this. It gets worse. He says he will not receive anything from the Lord. Anything. Not just wisdom. Not just wisdom. But anything that we're needing from God has got to come into our life through faith. It is a choice of our will. It is a choice of our, of our spiritual convictions to believe God and to trust God and to come to God on it. It is a settled conviction that, that God is and that God has promised in and on to God's character that we come to God and that we believe and that we ask and that we walk and that we live. That our life should be marked by faith. Believers ought to believe. Faith is, belief is faith in action. Believe in God and walking with God in it. Does anyone receive anything? Our prayer life is, is, is basically, basically going to be rendered ineffective completely. Now, doesn't it make sense? Think about it. Go back now. We're having trials and troubles. Hard times are coming. Remember, Satan always wants to interpret your pain. He always wants to lie about God through circumstances. If God is good, why are bad things happening to me? Because you live in a fallen world. You're a twice born person, a once born world. Those bad things didn't come by the will of God. They came by the consequence of sin. But one man came sin, and my sin came dead. Sovereign God allowed it, yes, for his, his sovereign purpose. Not to hurt you or destroy you, but to build you up. So what's coming in your life, it may be hurtful, it may be painful, but God has a glorious purpose and a glorious end. And faith says, I'm not going to let Satan interpret my pain to cause me to doubt God's love and God's faithfulness and God's trust in and for my life. It's okay. When trials come, your faith's being tested. But remember, faith is going to be greatly, greatly needed when you get on your knees and talk to God about what you're facing. If trials and troubles can get your faith to collapse, you can't even get on your knees and talk to God about your trials and troubles because you're already doubting God all about it. 
You see how Satan uses bad situations and hard times to his advantage. He tempted Adam and Eve to sin when they did all that God had warned would happen would. You'll die. They died spiritually immediately. They died physically eventually. And everything that came into the world through sin lays at the feet of Satan as the tempter and Adam and Eve as the tempter. And they disobeyed God. They didn't believe God. They didn't step in faith and say, no, God has said, I will not. They could have. They didn't. We can and we must. Believe in God. Well, number four, the condition that we're done. He said, let me, let me get, get a picture in your mind of this person who uh, has this faith at one time and this doubting at another. Isn't it crazy? You believe, you believe in God enough to talk to Him, but you don't believe enough to really believe He's going to answer. What kind of patronizing is that? What kind of silliness is that? What kind of foolishness is that? Oh, I believe in God. I talk to Him all the time, but I don't believe He's going to answer. Not really. Not really. It's kind of like, it's kind of like throwing up a shot from half court. <laughs> Just in case. I'm just, hope, you know, here, here, I'll throw a Hail Mary. Hope God. Hope, hope it happens. There ain't no faith in that. There ain't no trust in God in that. So we got to close our eyes and pull the trigger. I hope it is something. I'm hoping. God, James says, let me, let me describe that guy to you. Look at verse 8. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. James uses two adjectives to describe him. The first one is double-minded. Literally, it's the word two souls. This suke, two souls. And, and, and it's not a picture of a hypocrite who thinks one way at this moment and then changes my thing. It's a guy who tries to think two different ways at the same time. You can't do it. It's, it's a picture of a guy who, as Jesus would say, wants to love God and love the world at the same time. You can't do both. There's an all-expelling force to love. And if you love one, you're not going to love the other. You can't think God's way and the world's way at the same time. Paul Bunyan described him as the man who faces both ways. You can't, you can't do it. You'll break your neck trying. You can't do that. You just can't do it. James said, here's what, here's what, and I believe what he's saying is here's what it looks like to God. Here's how God sees you. Here's how God sees me when I'm when I, on my knees without, no, without any faith. Tony, I see you as a man trying to look both ways. It's like you're two people in one body. It's like the Spirit of God, the, the, the divine nature that God gave you redemption, and the fallen nature are both trying to talk and operate at the same time, and that won't work. Double-minded. Double-minded in all its ways. The next adjective he uses is the word unstable. It means fickle. It's Sometimes used of a guy that's staggering in drunkenness. It's used of that which is feeble and frail and has worn out in time and is just about to fall over and in need of being propped up and strengthened. He says, it's unstable. Can you think of a, of a, of a sadder way to think about walking through life as a Christian? It's just unstable and just staggering, staggering through life. Here we're talking about victory in Jesus, my Savior, for in a minute. And we just stagger around, unstable in all our ways. When Christ has said, in me, in me, you live and move and have be. In me, everything, everything that pertains to life and godliness is already in you and available to you. That guy who wants to be stable has got to find the stability of a faith that's settled not in himself, but is settled, is settled in Christ, in Him. Our faith must have an object, and that object is Christ. He says, live our life. The prophet Ezekiel, I mean, I'm sorry, the prophet Elijah put it this way, when People of Israel were trying to live for God and live for Baal. Remember Mount Carmel? What was his question to Mount Carmel? He said, how long will you halt between two opinions? You, 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 there's two opinions of God. You've got one that he's the only God, he's exclusive God to be worshipped. The other one, it's okay to worship these Baals and these man-made gods. He said, how long are you going to halt, falter, stand between two opinions? 
There's a town in Georgia called Between Georgia. It's between Atlanta and Augusta. It's called Between. I, 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 if I lived in between, I'd move. I don't, I don't live in between nothing. I want, to, I want to make up my mind where I live and whose I am. But that's exactly what Elijah asked him. How long will you hop between to opinion? When are you going to make your mind up that God is worthy of your absolute unwavering confidence? He's our God. Look at everything He's done. All that He's doing. Where in the world would we ever begin to doubt? Yeah, but i got this little circumstance over here. I've got this little pain over there. I've got this little thing back here. And Paul looked at it all and he said, Man, when you see the glory that God has for us, these things aren't worthy to be mentioned. They aren't even worthy to be mentioned in light of who He is and all that He's doing, all that He's done. Jesus talked to that Laodicean church. One commentator called him the sham of the Christian. What did he say to them? They lived in between Georgia. He said, you're not hot and you're not cold. You're just lukewarm. And let me tell you something, lukewarm makes me sick. I'm a bummer. Can you hear the words of, can you hear the heart cry of Jesus? Can you hear the brokenness of the heart of Jesus when he says to us, I would rather you be cold than that. Why? Because if you're cold, you'd know it. If you're cold, you would recognize how far you are from where you ought to be. But there is a betweenness. There is a uh, trying to face both ways. There is a faith and a doubt that tries to operate at the same time that keeps us lukewarm, that we still feel like we've got some warmth and we're okay, and our coldness doesn't seem to be so cold, so we accept it as a way. And what it does is it leaves us unstable in all of our ways. And we're, we're swerving here and there, and we're walking around, and we're all the time... God, I wish I had victory. God, I, I want to live in victory. God, I want to have... And, and Jesus says, Hey, Tony, you, you know how bad I want that for you? I died for you to have it. That's how bad I want it for you. It's included in the blood of my redemption. Remember that old story? It's an old story about the man who barely saved up enough money to come to America on the ship. But he didn't have any money to save up to, to pay for food, so he, he got some crackers and some cheese, and he wrapped them up in his... Belongings, and he went in and come supper time, they'd ring the bell and he'd go to his room. He went to his, it took months to come across at the time, and after a few weeks he was beginning to get sick, rickety, all kind of stuff. He, he went to the doctor, the doctor said, Man, you're malnourished, what's the problem? Why are you not eating? He said, Well, I only had enough money for the ticket, I didn't have any money for food. And the doctor looked at him and said, Did you not know that the meal was included in the price of the ticket? He'd been starving himself when the meal was included in the price of the ticket. That's a picture of most Christians I know. It's a picture of me sometimes, and it makes me aggravated at myself. If I didn't love me, I'd slap my jaws. <laughs> it was paid for in the price of the ticket. It was paid for in the blood of Christ. Victory and overcoming and walking in faith and in confidence and having a life where you know that, that in every way God has got your back and in every way that God is leading and guiding and He's making a way that, that Christ is leading us. And if He's leading everywhere we walk, as the old writer said, we're walking on conquered ground because the conqueror has already walked on it for us. He's already tread that way. He's already cut the path. He's already leading us to go. And it's by faith. By faith. A settled confidence and a trust that brings expectation and anticipation not because we're hoping and thinking maybe, but we know Him. That's why David could get on his knees in Psalm 51 and cry in his sin, God, according to Your loving kindness, according to Your mercies, I can come to You and ask for forgiveness because that's in accord with who You are. He knew God, and because He knew God, He knew how to pray. We know God. We know God because God has shown us who He is from Calvary. And He has settled forever those questions. That must be answered. Does God love me? How much does God love me? Will God provide me? Will God accept me? Will God really be concerned about who I am? Does God have a purpose for me? Does God have meaningfulness for my life? All those questions for us are answered unequivocally and forever at the cross. Forever. But Satan says, if I can get you to doubt like Eve, I can begin to steal, rob, and kill. Steal, rob, and kill. Steal, rob, and kill till you're like over here. You're over there. You're up. You're down. You're up. You're down. That wave. That wave. Well, I want to close this illustration. One day, after the uh, after Jesus sent the disciples away, 
And he comes walking out to them. In Matthew chapter 14, Peter sees him. And he calls out, Lord Jesus, is that you? He says, that's me. He said, but you, let me come to you. Jesus said, come on. Come on. Peter got out of the boat. Now, there's a lot of mention made about him sinking. We're going to talk about that. Let me tell you something. How many of you got out of the boat? When did you get out of the boat? Huh? Then don't be bad mouthing people. But listen to what he says. He got out of the boat. He begins to walk. He begins to sink. And he, he, he has the shortest prayer in the Bible. God save me. Lord save me. Listen. Immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and he called him and he said to him, listen, he said to Peter, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Well, we all know why. We all know the answer to that question. When he got out of the boat, his eyes were on Jesus. When he got out of the boat, he was walking in faith. But he had some circumstances going on around him. And he got his eyes off the Savior and he got his eyes on the circumstances. And circumstances always are interpreted to say, you better doubt. You better doubt. You're going under, dude. You're out here now, but oh, you're going to die. You're going to... He was a professional fisherman. He knew how to swim. You're going to die. You're going to die. You ever been in circumstances that said you're going to die? I've heard Satan say financially, you're going to die. You're my finances. We've been in a relationship struggle for Satan has caused us to die. Is my relationship going to make it? We've been in places where we, we, we were serving God and we're trying to honor and glorify God and Satan wants us to doubt and say, is God going to come through? And are, are you going to be able to accomplish what God calls you to do? Are you going to be able to get through it? Every area of our life, every part of our life, Satan wants to come. And Jesus, had, he asked a fair question. Uh, oh, you have a little faith. Why? Why did If you're staring at the cross and the love, the redemption, and everything that's provided by God through His Son on the cross, there's not a one of us that can find a rational thought in our head and why it's right to doubt. Doubt is the most stupid, ridiculous, irresponsible thing in the world when you're looking at the cross. When I take my eyes off the cross, and I start looking at the circumstances, and I start believing the lies that circumstances tell. Feelings, circumstances, situations, all of those things can lie. They're not always lies, but they can lie. And I hear that whisper with a lisp in the tongue. Has God really said? Will God really come back? Can you really trust God? I'm going to tell you, it's not always comfortable out on a limb where if God didn't come through, you're going to go back and eat it. You, you live, if God didn't come through and the limb breaks, you're going down. But I love the reminder that in fruit trees, out on the end of the branch is where the fruit is, not up on the trunk. You've got to get out on the limb sometime, and if God don't come through, you're going to like an idiot. Yeah, I've been there. I've been there. And you know what? God has always come through. Now, I look like an idiot from stuff I do, not stuff he does. Not stuff he does. God always comes through because He's promised He will. I'm standing here today and I'm preaching to you today some 30 something years later. Actually, 40 years later. Because the day I got in the altar and surrendered to preach, I went back to my little apartment, the Con Valley Apartments in San Antonio, Texas. And I did what I don't recommend you do. I just opened my Bible to one place, it was Timothy. Let no man despise thy youth. Good example. I was a young man. I thought that spoke to me. I turned a few pages over and I looked. It's 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And he said, Faithful is he who hath called you, who will also do it. And God said to me, I've called you. And if you'll give yourself to me, I'll do it in you and through you. I'm preaching today, these years later, because he's been faithful all these years to do it through me. To do it through me. I've, tried, I've tested him. I've tried him. And I found him faithful. David said, I was young and now I'm old. I've never seen this secret sin. I've never seen things for me. David said, I know who I believe in. The Apostle Paul, did he say, well, I know I believe in I'm persuaded. That's faith. I'm persuaded. You can't convince me. Circumstances, you're a bunch of liars. Feelings, you're a bunch of liars. 
I am convinced. I am persuaded. I know that He is able. He is able to keep that which I've committed to Him against that day. Against that day. You can't get me out of His love. You can't get me out of His concern. You can't get me out of His care. You can't get my picture off His refrigerator. He loves me. He bought me with His own blood. And He loves me. Can you hear that question this morning from heaven to you? Oh, you have little faith. Why? Did you doubt? Recognize it for what it is. Doubt is Satan's first temptation. To Eve, it's his first temptation to us. Can you really, did God really say that? Can you really believe what God said? Can you really trust God to do that? Can you really? James says, listen, if maturity, it, it, it's, 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 it's a thing of it's childishness not to believe, right? It's childish. Now, there is a childish faith is wonderful. But it's immature as a Christian not to believe God. As we grow up in Him, we, we, we believe more and more that He is and that He's able. So, the invitation this morning is where I got the title of the sermon. I'm going to ask you and me this morning to put death to our vow, to kill it. Let faith replace it. Take your eyes back off the waves of circumstance and situation and put your eyes back on the cross and let it forever settle the questions to your life, who you are before God and how much God loves you and what God wants for you. Maybe you're here today and you never trusted Christ to save the Lord. And one of the reasons you've never, you never opened your heart to believe God and trust Him in saving faith is you've really doubted if God could love you because uh, you've been reminded of how bad you are. Let me tell you, you don't have a clue. If you knew the people in this room like I do, and you know how bad they were before God saved them, if you knew me like I know me, and you knew what I was before God saved me, I doubt seriously there's anybody in the room that could say that in words. There's some people in this room, we were wicked people. We were wicked people. And God found us and saved us. And you know what it took for Him to save us? The same thing it's going to take for Him to save you. Faith. For by faith are you saved through grace. The gift of God, not a word, is the answer. What does that mean? That means this morning you've got to make up your mind that you are forever separated from the Holy God because of your sin. You've got to make up your mind and believe that Jesus Christ, God's sin, the Son, came and lived on this earth and he went to the cross and died to pay your sin debt. He went to the grave but because he had no sin of his own. The grave couldn't hold him. He came forth and he's alive today. And he's alive forevermore. Yeah. An awful life to everybody who will come to him by faith and in repentance. What is repentance? It's turning our back on that old sinful way and saying, Lord, I trust you to save me. And by the Spirit of God, I want to walk in obedience in the new life you have for me. Set free from the shackles of my sin that I was born in. I'm set free now to walk in faith with you. If you've never done that, I can't imagine today why you would doubt. Say, going to get you to doubt and put it off one more time. You know, there's going to come a day, the Bible says, God says, my spirit always drive with, drive with a man, that you can't be saved as the Spirit of God draws you. It's got to happen that way. And if the Spirit of God is drawing you to come to Christ, that's His promise that right now, this moment, He'll say, but listen to me, I love you too much not to tell you the truth. You have no promise that God will draw you again. If you say no to God today, you have no promise God will ever draw you again. He doesn't know you another draw. He doesn't know, know you another conviction to come to Him. He doesn't know you that. The grace, He may give it to you, but what, a, what an eternal gamble to turn away from the drawing of God right now today and not come to Him and save Him. Let's talk to those of us who are saved. It was by faith God saved us. But it's in by faith that we live in our life. Are we patronizing God? On our knees praying. We really can't say we're asking any expectation. We're asking with any real trust and confidence and hope. James says, listen, we can be one or two kind of people. We can be Calvary rock solid, standing firm like flint, but our face towards God. Unmovable, unshakable, standing in the promises of God. And we can be like that wave. Up and down. Over here, over there. That's the best you can hope for. If you won't find faith in standing and walk in it. And let the same faith that saves you be the same faith that sustains you day by day by day. Regardless of the circumstance, regardless of the trial, regardless of the amount of pain it may or may not have. And none of that changes the immutable truth of God's Calvary's love. Maybe today what he needs most from Faith Fellowship Church is a people who will say, 
like that daddy one day said, Lord, I believe you. Help that one. I believe God, I believe you. And when Satan comes to tempt me to doubt, Lord God, hold me strong. Spirit of God, rise up in me. Give me boldness. Give me courage to say, I will not doubt. He deserves better from me than that. I will not doubt Him. I will not patronize Him. I will believe in His settled love, His forever grace. Awesome blood of His Son. I will not be moved. You can't sing when you're standing on the rock. I might go up and down and over and back because I have been overwhelmed with Him. And in Him I live and move and have my being. I will not live that doubt, patronizing, fearful life but I'll stand in Him. Whatever the prayers this morning to save me, Lord, forgive me and we assure me as I reestablish my faith in you. And because you need to come, place your life in covenant membership. Whatever the decision is, it's always by faith that we obey. God speaks and we obey. That's faith. God speaks and we obey. I really believe this morning. I, I preached this morning with the conviction that every heart here needed to hear from God. I preached to stay under the conviction that God would speak to every heart, every soul, and every mind who came to the place today. Everybody who watches this sermon over, over the media, however it happens, I believe with all my heart that God's Word is going forth and God is wanting to accomplish something also in it, with it, and through it, and by it. But what it must have on our part, it must be met with faith. The choice of our will to say, I will receive and believe God's Word and let every other voice be alive. God is my truth. My strength. What does your response need to be this morning? If it's here at the altar, if it's there where you are, if it's there in a living room somewhere, in a distant place, it's not where you are, it's the faith you bow your head in. It's the faith you respond in that will move heaven and earth for you, to you, and with you. If you come to Christ in faith. James, Fathers, in faith we ask now for your spirit to clarify any confusion that somebody might have. Father, that uh, it might be clear and certain what it is you're saying to each and every heart. God, you're not a God of confusion. If Satan's trying to bring confusion, we know where it comes from. And God, we're not going to move off the clear truth you've spoken to our heart and mind this morning. Father, we confess the preacher can talk to my ears, but only God can speak to my heart. God, today as you speak, may we now respond and obey in faith and obedience for your glory and for your honor in Jesus' name. As you're